Are we on the verge of artificial general intelligence or are we still far behind? Can we trust these systems? And what the heck is AI anyway? And today I have the perfect guest to discuss this topic. things. So hello and welcome to my show. My name is Roy Yosevich and in this channel I discuss uh, science, philosophy, religion and uh, creativity, artificial intelligence with the most interesting people and scholars from all around the world. If this is your first time here, please consider subscribing and hit the bell button and donate a few bitcoins <laughs> to my wallet. And today I'm honored and privileged to have Uh, my guest on the show. Uh, this is the first time I have mixed feelings for my guest. And before I explain, let me introduce my guest. So my guest today is Professor Gary Marcus. Professor Marcus is, uh, is a scientist, author, entrepreneur, and a professor in the Department of Psychology at New York University. He is the founder of two AI startups. And probably will be more soon his books include guitar zero kluge and most recently rebooting AI which he wrote with Ernest Davis so hi Gary and thank you very much for coming to the show today thanks for having me and sorry it took so many months to set it up but... <laughs> okay and many thanks for to Iris Berent for uh, uh, making this uh, possible now let me explain why I have mixed feelings for you and A year ago, I decided to write a book on the subject of artificial intelligence to the general public, and I truly believe that we are almost there. Deep learning, greening go, deep mind, inception, the progress of NLP. But then I spoke with Iris, and she referred me to your book, Rebooting AI, and this book just blew my mind. It, I didn't read it, I just swallowed it. And, but basically your book just ruined everything for me. People ask me, what about your artificial intelligence book? You, you say that you are uh, going to publish it. Say, listen, in recent months, I read a book that completely changed my mind. And if I can summarize your book in a sentence, it's not that we are not there yet. You are saying that we are on the wrong track. Now, would you consider yourself like the bad boy of AI or like a sort of prophet of apocalypse? Oh, I don't know. I, I do think that my predictions have been a lot better than the ones that you'd read in the media. So <clears throat> you can go back to my 2012 article in The New Yorker on deep learning. And I think I projected all the problems that we're seeing now, problems with causal reasoning and knowledge and, and generalizability. And there's a 2016 interview I gave with John Brockman on the edge, which I just reread recently. And I think every word that I said there was true. Um, I'm not widely known as a prophet, but I think if you look you know at the data, I, I think, you know, am I a prophet of doom? I don't know, but the, I'm a prophet of we need to get our act together and we haven't yet. And so I, I, I like what you said a minute ago, which is I'm not saying we'll never get there. I'm saying we're on the wrong track. It's, people like to, um, to caricature me and say, well, Marcus thinks AI is never going to happen and that's stupid. But of course, that's not what I think. I think AI will happen. And I wrote a book with Ernie Davis to try to get us on a better track. I do think it can happen. But I think we're on a lousy track right now where we have AI that we can't really trust and isn't really very smart. And so it sort of seems to me like the worst moment in history for AI is right now because the stuff that we have is... is so mediocre it's dangerous you know when I was a kid there wasn't much AI in practice so it wasn't very dangerous and the AI when my kids grow up will probably be pretty good but right now it's not a great moment for AI doesn't mean I hate AI it means I hate you know the way we're doing it now and I want to see us do it better okay now when I read your book there is one name that came to my mind over and over again and this this name was Marvin Minsky and I think that uh, comparison is inevitable. Now, in 1969, Minsky- I'll give you a the... trivia fact, by the way. Yes. Marvin's last appearance in, in semi-public at a private function, um, but last stage appearance was with me. Kind of an wow. in interesting historical fact. Yes. Uh, Something called TTI Vanguard. I don't know if it's recorded online, but that was, I think, his last appearance. 
Oh, so now uh, we, uh, 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 he, he, he resembles uh, my neighbor. I have an old neighbor which looks exactly like Marvin Minsky, and it's, it's scary. Now, Marvin Minsky in 1969, one of the founding fathers of AI, the godfather of AI, a, along with uh, Samuel Puppet, wrote a book called Perceptrons, and in which he argue that a simple perceptron is unable to learn even a very simple logical function like so, and... Those functions can be learned only with multi-layer perceptrons or, or, or neural network, but he proved that the training of the weights will take forever. And many people today regard this book as what uh, started the winter of AI. Now, now we are- Can I jump in for one yes. second? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, there's, the claim that they really made was that there was no guarantee of convergence in learning nonlinear functions with multi-layer networks. And a lot of people blame them for sort of the end of neural networks, which I think is false. We can talk about why they, they certainly slowed them down, but I don't think they ended them. I think that they slowed down because they weren't really working. Um, and you know, in 2005 was a long time after 1969 and people were playing around with them and they just weren't very good then. And so they were ridiculed, not from the kind of Minsky side of the spectrum, but the SVM people ridiculed the neural networks because they weren't working then. And you know, I think we all know that what changed that was having a lot more data and GPUs and so forth. But people like to pin that on Minsky. And I think what Minsky and Papert said was actually true, which was there's no guarantee of convergence. And we what they got wrong was you could do a lot of stuff, but not everything without convergence, without a sort of guarantee you know the, minsky was a mathematician originally and and he was looking for proof and there was no proof that those systems were going to work and it turns out mm -hmm. even in the absence of proof they can work in some things and not others and it's still very empirical in a way that a mathematician might find messy like yeah these things work sometimes and they don't always work and when when and, and so forth so i think minsky gets a, a raw deal in history on, on that one i think if you go back and read carefully what he said that it was actually still true um, and it was, you know, left to other people to figure out what you could do in the absence of convergence. So my question regarding Minsky, I, I totally agree with you because right now we, we still don't know why neural network work the way they work and we have like expandable AI. Or when they will work. Demand. Or when and, when, or, and when. But my point is that Minsky basically said, uh, just like I think 15 years before uh, the invention of the backpropagation algorithm, that we don't have, I, A, I don't know if this algorithm will converge and B, it will take many, many, it, it will take for, for days to train or even for months. And, but my question is, it seems that you say something completely different. You say something fundamental about the essence of artificial intelligence. You say it's not the CPU power that we are missing, it's the understanding of in intelligence. So I think, I think in a way, your claim is much stronger claim than what Minsky said in his perceptrons. Would you agree? Well, I think it's a lot of different claims and, and he's, you know, he, he made a number of claims on his career. That particular book was narrowly constructed. It was constructed in a mathematical way saying we have these great proofs about what you can do for linearly separable functions, simple functions. And we can't find that for the nonlinear separable ones. They were actually people playing around with back propagation around the same time as wrote that book. Jürgen Schmidhuber has written a really detailed history of back propagation, which has been invented many times, including in the 1960s when that, that book was written, um, just as a historical aside. Um, but so that book was narrowly construed. It was, can we do this mathematical thing? And the answer was no, and they were right about that. And then there were implications for like how we should build models and so forth. Um, he had other times thought about the nature of intelligence, but that book wasn't really about it. My book, uh, sorry, not my book, my, my work has in large part <coughs> been about comparing the human mind to machines. You know, a lot of my work for many years was just about the human mind, how kids learn language, which is a truly amazing feat, um, questions like that. Um, and I would say that the arguments that I have been making with respect to AI for the last few decades have really been about generalization. 
Um, they've really been about if you have a certain amount of data, is that enough to get you to the rest of what you want? And the, the simplest demonstration that I made that I think is really the most prescient thing that I've done is I showed in 1998 that you could take a neural network, train it on a function, the identity function, f of x equals x times one. And if you trained it on the even numbers, you wouldn't generalize it to the odd numbers. And I was accused of making a terrorist attack on neural networks in the <laughs> unpublished review. Um, people hated me for this and they thought it was irrelevant. But in the subsequent almost 30 years, eh, or 25 years, um, I think that's actually become received wisdom. Um, and the measure of that is that Yashua Bengio has now oriented his whole research program around it. So he talks about um, what is his vocabulary, something like out of out of uh, training extrapolation, I forget his exact formulation, but it's basically the same thing as, as I was saying all along. Um, Bengio has realized that the Achilles heel of these systems is they don't generalize very far. They generalize some, and that's been a source of enormous confusion. So these models do generalize some, but they typically have problems with outliers because if you think of like a cloud of points, they're really good inside the cloud of data points that they've got. You go outside that cloud of data points and they're just clueless. And that's really the Achilles heel. And that's why, for example, you know, with all the data that Tesla has, they still can't make a safe driverless car because <clears throat> eventually you get to these outlier cases. And that's a problem with these language. Well, it's one of the problems with these so-called large language models. I always teach my students that those systems are very good in interpolation and not extrapolation because extrapolation yeah. means deduce something beyond what you have seen. And this is very, very hard to do even uh, uh, for uh, machines, but uh, human beings are uh, notoriously good at this. Now, let me please go, when we start, when we discuss the subject, now we first need to define the terms. And the term of what is artificial intelligence, let me just tell you that when I started uh, uh, writing my artificial intelligence book, I thought how, you know, artificial intelligence aim to emulate human intelligence. So I might write a chapter devoted to human intelligence and this, and I knew nothing about human intelligence and IQ and all those great research. Uh, and I, I was so fascinated that I ended up writing a, four, a 400 pages book about human intelligence. And human intelligence is very interesting, very sophisticated, very, it's like the biggest adventure of psychology in the last one, 120 years. And let me please show you what uh, Patrick Winston, uh, he's, he was uh, the head of the AI lab in MIT, what he says about uh, artificial intelligence. Now, this is the last minute from his AI talk. And in this minute, he said that one student approached, approached him about a, an AI program that can solve integrals. So please just, it's uh, 40 seconds. Long time ago, I was talking with a, a student who said, computers cannot be intelligent. And I said, okay. Maybe you're right, but let me show you this program. So I showed it the integration program working on problems like this. And after uh, I showed him a couple of those examples, he says, well, all right, I, I guess maybe they can be intelligent. I'm learning how to do that. It's not always easy. Then I made a fatal mistake. I said, let me show you how it works. <laughs> and we spent the, an hour going through it like this. And at the end of that time, he turned to me and said, I take it back. It's not intelligent after all. It does integration the same way I do. <laughs> I take it back. They are not intelligent. They do they they do does they do exact integration like I do. So if if the computer acts like you, it is not intelligent. But when you are doing it, you are intelligent. So it's not fair. What is the definition of AI in your perspective? Well, I mean, first, I, I mean, it's a, a funny anecdote, but I don't think per se that it's right. So, you know, <clears throat> if you could get machines to do essentially the same things as people do, I would grant them uh, the notion of intelligence. <clears throat> I think, in fact, that the notion of intelligence 
is um, often treated as if it's a one dimensional variable. You know, you have an IQ, it's a number 110 or 92 or whatever. Um, but really, there are many dimensions of intelligence. There are many things that go into intelligence. So there's <clears throat> verbal intelligence and symbolic intelligence, mathematical intelligence, physical intelligence, and even those are too coarse a category. So there are lots of different things that different aspects to intelligence. And <clears throat> it is hard to define. I think what's missing from current systems is not kind of brute force computation, like alpha fold and alpha go are amazing examples of things that you could call intelligent if you want. But <clears throat> what's missing is the ability to look at a problem that you've never seen before and relate it to other problems that you have seen before and come up with a solution to that. The kind of flexibility and adaptability is certainly core to intelligence, and that's the piece that's missing. And related to that is a kind of verbal intelligence of being able to relate a sentence to a situation in the world or to somebody's beliefs or desires, <coughs> goals and so forth. And you know, current systems just don't have that at all. Now, one thing before we move on to uh, understanding language, which I think is a fundamental thing in your uh, argument, it is, I, I, I was surprised to know that even AlphaGo Zero, if you change the domain of the of the board if you just like take one piece out of the board it won't operate well so so it even alpha go zero cannot general generalize from the board of go to a very tiny modification of go which i was mesmerized by this but how 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 could it not generalize it's just essentially <coughs> memorizing and interpolating. There's no fundamental abstraction there. I mean, they build in a, a couple of things, but <coughs> there really isn't a comprehension even of a notion like territory. It's really just a massive number of examples and saying, you know, in the closest example, what would I do? And that's just <coughs> all it is. If you took one stone away, I think we'd probably still do fine. I don't know a result like that, but if you change the shape of the board, it would have a lot of trouble. Now, again, I want to quote something from your book. Now, you say those systems tend to learn superficial statistical correlations and not something profound. Now, there is like a, a, a very nice meme on the internet, and it goes like this. Now, I guess that you're familiar with it. So basically... <laughs> so basically, you go get like a scrap in the wall, and the scrap is like a statistic, and no one like it. And when you phrase it, and when you frame it, uh, so you can call it machine learning, and when you call it artificial intelligence, but basically, machine learning and artificial intelligence are merely statistical functions, statistical correlations. The best book on AI or machine learning is called ISLR, Introduction to Statistical Learning. So haven't we made any progress from, I don't know, from SVM and nearest neighbor, or I don't know, from the work of Ronald Fisher in the 20s to 2021? It is still just a brute statistics? Most of it is. Um, I don't think that artificial intelligence and machine learning are at all the same thing. I think machine learning is a set of tools for artificial intelligence. <clears throat> we do have another set of tools for symbolic knowledge representation, for example, traversing a taxonomy. It's not a statistical tool, although you can add some statistics into it. Um, so we have other tools and we, we do things like plotting the best route from point A to point B without using statistical learning. Again, there's you know lots of room for quantitative data and so forth, but that aren't using the same kinds of techniques. So nobody's running um, their traffic navigation systems by using pure deep learning, for example. You know there there are places where certain tools are good, and <coughs> places where those tools are not very good. It is true that there's been a lot of progress using the deep learning kind of stuff for particular problems. <coughs> Please let's pause for a second. <clears throat> <All right. clears throat> so th there's been a lot of progress in classification problems and not that much progress using the same techniques for problems like reasoning and problems like understanding language. We can talk a bunch about 
GPT-3 and why I think that it's fundamentally misleading, but I don't think it's real progress there. But when when you had a talk with Lex Friedman about what AI can do, and you said like, okay, we have like the vision thing, you know, from AlexNet to ImageNet to Inception, and we know that those vision systems, those convolutional neural network can perform much better than humans. But in your latest, in your latest article, his AI found a new foundation, you show this thing and you show like, I have a, an, an Apple, yes, a Granny Smith, and the network know, it knows it's not just an Apple, it's a Granny Smith, and you can uh, classify this specific Apple. But if I take, a, I don't know, a, a post-it note, and I just stick a post, a, a, like an iPod, a, I just write iPod on the Apple, and many people say, no, this is cyber. What we are doing is like cyber attack. But okay, I agree that this is can can be considered a cyber it's, attack. It's, but it's not a cyber network- attack. It, it's it's an evaluation of a technology. It doesn't have to be an attack to figure out, hey, what does this system actually do? What is it good for? And what we see <clears throat> is it's not very subtle. It doesn't have the ability to represent a complex hypothesis like an apple behind a piece of paper called a piece of paper with the words iPod on it. The system is is very brittle. It, now, it's I, not an attack. It's an analysis. Okay. I totally agree. But I, I wanted to ask you, there was like a thing two years ago, a very big fiasco in Google when Google image classified one of a, a, one of Google's friends as a gorilla. So it was a very famous, I, I, I think that you're f- familiar with this. Yeah, it's more like eight or 10 years ago. And it, yeah, yeah. Facebook so it, had the same problem and, earlier this year. And then you say, fuck you, Google. Uh, my friend is not a gorilla. Now, what I wanted to say in regarding to this scenario, this fiasco, that if you take out all the emotional things that we have of classifying people as apes, okay, and classifying and, and you know, white people, black people, the <coughs> Metric, the objective metric was not far away. Okay, it it if you don't take if you don't insert the weight of of what does it mean to misclassify a human being as an ape? So the metric function didn't fall far behind. But if you show me a, an apple and you write on the apple iPod, and this and the network cannot deduce that this is an apple. So basically the network doesn't understand what it sees. And this is basically your argument, yes? There's very little comprehension. There's no ability to understand nuance. So <clears throat> when I look in your room, you know, even though some of it's out of focus, I recognize there's some furniture. I recognize a person, a microphone. I understand that you are between the microphone and the, let's say it's the desk back there. Um, I understand that you're probably supported by a chair, even though I only see part of the chair. So making inferences about the relations between entities. When I see that picture of an apple with a piece of paper with the word iPod in front of it, I don't just pick the most popular thing in the room. <coughs> I pick, I understand as a relation between entities. And these systems just can't do that. Now, one- All they do is yes. say, which pattern in my database is this most like? Uh, okay. Now, one thing that you said in your book, which I tremendously <laughs> love, is how much prior knowledge do we need when we interpret the world? Now, you gave an example of a, a person with a, that lost his wallet, so he tapped his pocket so mm-hmm. you to find out whether his wallet is still there. And you said, and I was, wow, you're absolutely right. There is so much prior knowledge that we put into even a very simple sentence that is not encoded in the sentence itself. So could you please elaborate on this? Because this is something that is completely like flip the way I see those things. Those things need many, many pieces of information that they are not being given. And we know them just because we are human beings who live in the outer world. I think if you take any scene in any movie that you like, you will see that a lot of the connections are not spelled out, that the director is leaving it for you to figure things out. And you feel smart if you figure them out. 
And, you know, the director has some sense of what you will be able to figure out. But almost never is every little thing spelled out. And the director is not going to sit there and explain to you what a glass is. The director is going to assume that you understand what a glass is from your prior experience. If the glass falls, <coughs> the director is not going to say, hey, there's sharp pieces there. The director is going to assume that you can figure that out. Or same thing if you read a story, um, whether it's fiction or nonfiction. If the writer articulated absolutely everything that they expect that you would know, it would be incredibly tedious. But <coughs> they're assuming that the viewer, their audience is a human being who knows how the world works. And you are able to make an interpretation of what's going on by putting together, <coughs> excuse me, all of these little pieces that you have kind of come across through your life with what's happening right now in order to build a cognitive model is what I like to call it of the scene, you know, what's happening now and form interpretation. And that's just not what current systems are equipped to do. When people are dead, they know they never going back to life or when you're thirsty and you drink, you probably be, will be less thirsty. Now, these things are so simple, so like transparent to us that we forget that we need to encode them into this, those systems. And th this is why you say we have no understanding whatsoever of language. And he was told me that if you ask Siri, give me a restaurant which is not McDonald's, it will give you McDonald's. And wow, this is a very simple sentence to grasp, to understand. Give me a restaurant which is not McDonald's, okay? Not McDonald's restaurant. And even this simple sentence is very hard for those systems to understand. How can it be? I mean, I, I think the systems that we have are fundamentally wrongheaded. They're trying to short circuit the problem. So it's, it's not that this problem of common sense is unknown. McCarthy wrote about it in 1959. <clears throat> Minsky talked about it occasionally. Doug Lennett spent his entire career trying to distill common sense into machine interpretable form. But it, <clears throat> it's hard work. People don't want to do the hard work. They want to be able to substitute massive data for doing that hard work. And they've confused themselves into thinking that that's possible <coughs> using systems like GPT-3, which get things right you know, 75% of the time and give the illusion that they have more going on than they actually do. So all the clues are there that this is not going to work, but people keep going after it because there's low-hanging fruit. They're <coughs> very close to running out of low-hanging fruit, and the field has really kind of changed. In the last few months, people have started to realize, hey, this isn't working. Because I, you said that you haven't been given a, a permission to access GPT-3 to check it. It's Still like, not. After a yeah. year. I mean, there's great irony there, right? The, there's a company called OpenAI made GPT-3. And the premise Holtz, of- Holtz, George Holtz, I, I think, yes? No, 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 he's not part of it. Um, OpenAI was supposed to kind of like save the world from bad AI by- doing everything open and then they figured some stuff out and they're like let's make money we'll still be a non-profit in part and we won't be open anymore but we'll keep the name <laughs> and we won't share with scientists we don't want reputable scientists to look at what we're doing because we know it's not that great and they they will call us out on it so it'd be better marketing if we don't share it with them we will share what we're doing with the media it's gullible and not <clears throat> with people like marcus who actually understand what's going on and so it's been <laughs> over a year <laughs> I, it's like it's like this, it, you know but but you are a, a, a very unique voice in the world of ai I, i it's you and melanie mitchell which speaks on those subjects over and over again but i don't see other people in this industry in this fascinating world say listen i, I know that benigo starts uh, like listen we need to re rethink what what we are doing but you are still you and melanie mitchell are, are, are unique voices no well and ernie davis my my co-author yes 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 many many pieces with um me but yeah there aren't that many of us it's always you know <clears throat> easier to make a living being an optimist i think so you know the books that sell the most on the ai on ai are the ones are like oh we, we're on the verge of, of you know a miracle a singularity da, da, da. <laughs> And the public eats that up and they don't really want to know that, hey, this is really hard and it's not actually going to happen in your lifetime. Nobody wants to hear that message. You must read this book, guys. I tell you, it's like, a, 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 it's not a life changing, but it's like, it's, 
it was basically life changing for me because I need to re, I need to rethink my entire book all over again. Now, when I read your book, I came across Immanuel Kant, the very famous 18th century philosopher who basically said that when we approach to understand the world, we are provided like with inherent a priori categories of the mind and the top most the top or the most the three most important the three most important are time space and causality now causality so let's start with time and space and move on to causality because causality because correlation is not causation and we need to uh, dig it through but what do you mean that we need to equip those machine learning or AI systems with time, with the notion of time and space? You have to be able to ask yourself, when you're thinking about something, where is it in you know, four dimensions in time and space? And you have to <coughs> ask yourself, when you see two things that are related to one another, are they actually causing it? You know, is A causing B or is C causing A and B? And these are really basic to human beings. And there's good evidence with infants that even human infants you know, have some recognition of these things. But <clears throat> the machines that are popular right now don't really have those things. I mean, th there's tension going back to Minsky in, in the 1950s. For, for decades, there's been two kind of schools of thought in AI. And people disrespect each other and don't want to borrow from one another. And that's really part of the problem here is that the people doing neural networks don't want to take anything from classical computation, but classical computation is what makes most of the software in the world work. And so they're kind of like, for political reasons, tying their hands behind their backs. And then when they get a little bit of success, then they get really full of themselves. And that's kind of where we are right now without kind of looking down the football field to see where this is all going. And your argument is that all the big AI systems for just for example, uh, uh, Deep Blue and AlphaGo Zero, they use, they use a fusion of many techniques, deep neural network and convolutional network and uh, search trees. So you cannot solve everything. It's not, like, it's not like a throw hammer when you can smash every problem with artificial general intelligence, with neural networks or deep neural networks. You need to fuse. Some of the problems that I face with my students or with my company is just like strictly computer vision and not every computer vision problem is AI. Some of the computer vision problem can be solved even better with traditional approaches, yes? Yeah, there's a little edit there. I mean, I would say the traditional approaches are part of AI. That, you know, again, AI is this much broader. Yeah, 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 yes, yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. Not everything um, so is out of, is deep neural nets. Not everything is deep neural nets. And in fact, if you look at some of the most successful systems, they have deep neural networks as part of what they do, but they have other stuff that's less sexy. People talk about less. So <clears throat> AlphaFold, sorry, AlphaGo has tree search, which is about as old, a, you know, as classical an AI technique as there is. And it works with symbols like we'd find in a classical computer. AlphaFold has a bunch of stuff that's built in about the very nature of the specific problem of protein folding that it's working on. And I think we find over and over again, <coughs> we actually need some of those classical techniques, but they're sort of out of favor. So people kind of sweep them under the rug. What we really need is a better science about how to integrate those old techniques with the new techniques, not just one-off for protein folding, but in general. Now, if I think about it, there is a very nice book uh, written by Peter Norvig called Artificial Intelligence in General Approach. And it sums many of the techniques you know, like BFS, DFS, many other techniques and research and many, many techniques. And I think that it doesn't cover deep neural nets, but we have many techniques up uh, in our bag, bag of tricks that people usually dismiss when we speak about AI because deep neural network became so sexy. And when you want to, you know, to, to raise money or to find with <clears throat> money, you need to say, yeah, this is a deep neural network and et cetera. So we you just- know the old yes. quote from Santayana, he who's, he who, for, well, I can't quite get the words, but he who forgets history is doomed to repeat it. And that's sort of what's happening now, right? The, the whole Norvig and Russell book of techniques, all of those have their place, right? And, and you have people that are like, 
don't even read the old stuff. They're just like, I've got this new tool and I'm going to use it for everything. So it's, you know, to a man who has a hammer, everything is a nail. We have a lot of that going on. Okay. Now, and the other thing that account uh, uh, wrote about was causality. Now, we always teach our students that co- correlation isn't causation and all these things, but causality is a very slippery thing because even David Hume said, we don't find causality in nature and Kant said, oh, causality is what's within us. We perceive the world in terms of causality. So, but you say in your book that we have... methods we have systems that can interpret or can like understand causality like a uh, I don't know like the, this uh, this flow chart diagram that you have there so we have a ways to grasp causality yes I think it's an unsolved problem I mean you know one way to think about AI in general is it's sort of like physics before Newton. There's a lot of observations. <clears throat> There's some techniques you can use. You know, it's not as if we couldn't do any engineering before Newton. Um, we can do a bunch of engineering now, but we're missing some fundamental insights. And some of those are around causality. So there's some mathematics that people have. It doesn't fit that well with deep learning. Some people are trying to see how to integrate it. Um, but there's something even deeper that I think is missing. You know, you and I, we look at the world and we think of it in terms of, causes and effects. <laughs> We think if I press this pedal, the car is going to go forward. It's not a correlation. You know, I mean, it's a causal correlation. It's not just a correlation. Um, if we try to interpret a medical study, we try to say, you know, did A cause B or is it just a coincidence? Was there maybe <coughs> a confound and now the subjects were chosen? We reason about things. We just don't really know how to do that yet to <coughs> systematically reason. about the cause of forces in order to build interpretations of the world is to build interpretations of the world you need to come back to all these things like symbols and representations that are out of fashion but I think still useful and if, if you don't have that is it's hard to see even how to get going now in your most recent article you lament on the gap between AI researchers and cognitive psychologists linguistic expert and And let me quote so so from your latest uh, from your latest article you quote someone else while many approaches that have dominated over the last decade tend to focus mostly on one end of the spectrum we believe that exploring manners to reach better balance between the two are promising avenue for future research for example seems and then you you say seems like an accord recasting of what Steven Pinker said in his 1999 bestseller World and Wolves Okay, so there is a rich literature in co- co- cognitive psychology, linguistic, <clears throat> pinker work, but the people of AI are basically unaware of what other people did in other disciplines, like people like I- Iris Berendt and Lisa Feldman and other people who study what intelligence is, what representational systems means, yes? Yeah, I, I think that there's an arrogance right now. in machine learning because they've made a bunch of progress. Um, there's an arrogance to think that they don't need to listen to other people. So here's an example is <clears throat> every linguist knows that part of what goes on when you interpret a sentence is you understand the syntax of a sentence and then you understand the semantics, the meaning, and then the pragmatics, how it fits into the world. This is like axiomatic if you're a linguist, but we have the system GPT-3 that's very popular It doesn't do any of that. You know, it actually is able to replicate the statistics using, sorry, replicate the syntax using the statistics, but the semantics aren't really there. So, you know, if you ask the linguist what the semantics are, they'll start telling you about things like, well, who's the agent in this sentence? What is the object? And, you know, what, what's happening to that object? You can't ask GPT that. And it's not there anywhere. And in a rational world, people would say, hey, We have these fancy systems, but they're not making contact with the things that people who study language for a living take to be fundamental. Why is that? What can we do about that? Let but me just to even get that conversation going. 
let me just give you an, an, a great example that Gary gives about how, what does it, what does he means that by saying GPT-3 doesn't understand, you give a, a, a fabulous example with like an orange juice. He wanted to drink orange juice, but then you, you added a, 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 a reward that was like a, it was grape juice and cranberry juice. Yeah, 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 yeah. We're talking about the same example. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, Could I you please you repeat me. this example? Because I think that this example nails what you just said. Those systems don't have an, un, an profound understanding of what is being told. So, so the example is in an article called GPT-3 Bloviator. Um, it was in Technology Review. And I can tell you that the word Bloviator was supposed to be bullshit artist. Um, because that's what GPT-3 is, is a bullshit artist. Like somebody comes into a room and pretends to know about things, but doesn't really. And so to make that point, we had some <coughs> examples like this. So what GPT-3 does is it finishes sentences. You give it a bunch of sentences and finish them. So it was like, <coughs> you're in a room, you have some cranberry juice, but there's not, but you're really thirsty, there's not enough to drink. So you add some grape juice. And then what happens next, basically? And the system says, you drink it because you, you know, you've got this mixture that sort of makes sense, but it's just doing it because the statistics of drink <coughs> happen to correlate with the rest of the sentence. And then it says, you die. Well, nobody's ever died from drinking cranberry juice mixed together with grape juice. In fact, there's a commercial product in the US called cran grape juice that is a mixture <laughs> of it too. And you, know, you have input of 500 billion words of text or whatever it is. Probably cran grape was actually in the input corpus. <coughs> But the system doesn't reason. It doesn't like say, I'm going to cross check in my database to see if anybody's ever had cranberry juice and grape juice before. It's just correlating the words um, drink and thirsty and you can't smell or something like that with death. And so it's like picking out some random little bits to come up with its answer, but it's not reasoning about it. So it's very, <coughs> very different from how a person would, would look at the same sentences. It's like NLP when, when you teach people about NLP and the vector of words and, and, and the vector. So in many cases, it's, it actually works. So dog, the vector of the word dog will be similar to, to the vector of, of I, I don't know, the word cat. And the vector of happy will be similar to the vector of joyful. But again, it's just mere statistics. It's not... Yeah, it's so, not so when I was in grad school, a guy named Tom Landauer predicted a lot of, or foreshadowed in a way, a lot of what's happened. And I think made a mistake that I saw then and I've seen repeated <clears throat> many times since, which is he showed truthfully that you could correlate words with geography. And so <clears throat> if you do co-occurrence statistics, um, New York and Boston come up together pretty often. And so does Los Angeles and San Francisco. Cause like, they're both on the East Coast or they're both in California. <clears throat> and you could actually do like multidimensional scaling or something like that on vectors that were made from the co-occurrence statistics and come up with something that looks a little bit like a map. But the question is, is a little bit like a map what you want? Or do you want an actual map? So you get something a little bit like a map because the way that people use words is actually correlated loosely with the geography, but it's not perfect. So like, New York and LA come up together a lot because like, you know, actors go back and forth and musicians go back and forth and they're both big cities and so forth. So the geography isn't perfect. So if you're given the choice between a map and this half-assed correlate, you really want to use the map and not the half-assed correlate. And you don't want to think that because I have a half-assed correlate that I have come up with the solution to geography that allows me to not use maps. But what we are doing now <coughs> is exactly that, but writ large. You get correlates, you know, it is correlated. You drink things when you're thirsty, but that doesn't <coughs> mean just because you've noticed that correlation, you actually have a representation of beverages and drinking and, and hydration and physiology and so forth. And people get misled over and over and over. <coughs> and then they scratch their heads and they're like, why don't these systems work better? What can I do about it? You can't do anything about it because it's just statistics and there is no deeper representation. It's like it, it the works. Big, sorry. <clears throat> the big thing now is that these systems all say nasty things, right? They're trained on the nasty ravings of some of the 
you know, worse people on Reddit, plus, you know, lots of reasonable stuff too. Not everybody's nasty, but if you train them on nasty stuff, they will repeat the nasty stuff. So now there's a whole industry and how do we make these systems less rude and impolite and evil and, and so forth. And the way they work, all these systems is they take the nasty system that is just replicating the garbage that it sees, and then they try to filter it, but they can't really do that well. And they filter some of the good stuff. And it's just a mess. It's like band-aids on top of band-aids on top of <coughs> band-aids. It's, it's like what you said at the beginning of our talk. It, like, it works 80% of the time uh, uh, thanks to correlation, but we don't know when and uh, why will be the missing 20%. And those 20% might be crucial. And this is why the name of your book is Building Artificial Intelligence We Can Trust. It is fun for the 80%, but if I want like full proof, I cannot get the 20% just off balance or just yeah i mean so th that was the subtitle of the book is build building machines we can trust <clears throat> and the title is rebooting ai and the point is without a reboot we're just going to keep incrementally changing from 80 to 81 percent but not get really where we need to be sometimes things look like they're on the right path and aren't now reading your book made me think or we think about uh, john thurl john thurl argument about the chinese room so what do you expect? Because basically what you are saying right now, guys, there is no understanding, like human level understanding, or I don't know how, how you want to call it, transcendental understanding. Or, but what do you expect those systems to have? Or how do you imagine an artificial general intelligence system with understanding? Would you say that such a system can be operate on like a MacBook M1 or we need a quantum computing power or something that is profoundly different in hardware. <laughs> maybe we need something, maybe the, com the current computer so hardware doesn't support the concept of human un un understanding. Well, I mean, I don't know, maybe you need, you know, four M1s hooked up or something like that. But I, I don't think that the hardware is the problem. I think it's the software. We don't know how to leverage the hardware that we've got to make systems that are efficient learners and good reasoners and so forth. I don't think it's impossible. <clears throat> you know, we right now have a regime where the quality of the intelligence is very proportional to the amount of data and the amount of compute. I mean, it's not very good intelligence anyway, but to the extent that it does stuff, you need a lot of compute, but you know, humans are a different paradigm. You, you can take humans that don't have a lot of experience with the world, but still have pretty deep comprehension. Like my seven and eight year old kids don't have an enormous amount of experience because they're only seven, eight years old, but they completely understand the physical world around themselves. That doesn't mean they understand quantum mechanics, but if they run through a playground, they understand, you know, the relation between all the entities and themselves and how their bodies fit in with these kinds of things. They much can better than the robot of Boston Dynamics. This is basically what much, what much better. Saying. All the Boston Dynamics things that you see are, you know, carefully rehearsed. Like when they do par parkour, they've tried it 21 times. You see one successful iteration and they have like special marks on the floor. So the robot needs to know where it starts. You know, when my kids go to the playground, they can do their parkour kind of thing on a new playground that they've never been to when it's a little bit wet and the light is different from it was before. They have much richer, more general representations of physical objects, causality, their bodies that allow themselves to be vastly more general. And the same thing is true for language, true. Like, you know, I can talk to Siri and say, hey, Siri, turn on the lights. But I can say essentially anything to my kids. And if it doesn't require like, you know, <coughs> college level math or whatever, they'll understand, right? And understand at the level of like, they could paraphrase it. They can act on it. They can ask questions about why and fill in things that they don't know, given those answers and, you know, put all this stuff together. There's no machine right now. <coughs> this is very important. This is very important. Now, current uh, NLP or current language understanding systems don't ask you, hey, I didn't understand this. I didn't understand this. Please repeat. They don't know what they didn't understand. I think that this is a crucial argument. Yeah, they, they don't. And so like the <coughs> level at which these systems can clarify is pretty crude. So Siri can now clarify a little bit. Like if I say set a timer, they might ask me like, 
I'm trying to think of a good example of what Siri actually does, but I know if there's two sets of lights, it might ask me, you know, do you mean the living room lights or the dining room lights? So there's a little bit of clarification, but there's nothing like the clarification that you get with a human. I mean, our whole conversation is clarification. Did you really mean to say this thing in the book? Can you elaborate? Like it's, you know, much more abstract level of clarification. A lot of conversations are like that. Not all of them, but many of them are, you know, you tell me you're feeling bad. And I'm like, well, could you tell me a little bit more and you say, well, it's about my relationship. And then, you know, what, what, <coughs> what happened? And, you know, and so it's like a lot of clarification back and forth. I'm building a richer cognitive model of your situation so I can give you advice. So you, I mean, this is hypothetical. I just saw your wife uh, before and she's, you seem to be getting along, but let's say that you just had a fight and, you know, then I might ask you, you know, well, what was the fight about? Have you thought about her perspective? Where was she coming from? She and is great. She is great. My wife is great. My wife is great. My wife is great. <laughs> Hypothetically. And now, understand, and now you understand what I just said, because I, I, I it's like, I, I am scary that my wife will listen to our interview and then say, oh, wait, wait. Get the, like, yeah, the, the so, wrong idea. So I've chosen the wrong idea. Yes, no, no, no. Let's say this I had a fight great. with my wife. No, no, no. Hypothetically. <laughs> this is great because in this uh, simple chat that we had, we had many prior knowledge that we knew about relationship, husband-wife relationship that was not specifically mentioned in the sentence and you know what I'm talking about I know what what you are talking about and this so is for example funny. I can understand that since your wife is watching us recording or maybe watching recording that you would be uncomfortable in speaking fully candidly right so I know enough about human nature not about you in particular yeah but yeah, I yeah. know that human beings for example sometimes share things with one set of people and not another and so like I can make all of the, <coughs> these inferences around it and understand why you might be in an uncomfortable situation while I'm even talking about this. There is no computer that could like sit there and make that analysis of these layers of complexity, layers of knowledge. It's like this old television show called Get Smart. The, one of the things the character would say is, I know that you know that I know that you know that da, 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 da. Well, we can reason about that. I know that you know that I know that you know, you know that I'm kidding here. And you know, that makes it all okay. And again, let me just put it uh, because some of the viewers will uh, are like uh, students of computer science. And again, even the most like, like the best convolutional neural network inception four, okay, that can classify 1,000 different uh, uh, categories. If a child, an infant, a toddler, a, like he needs to see like three or four dogs, And then he can extrapolate and generalize and say, "Ah, I know what dog is. It doesn't need and to be shown the easy stuff is recognizing yeah. dogs. Let's talk about the heart which those systems already have trouble. Let's talk about the hard stuff, like recognizing um jealousy or or partial information and knowledge, right? Like a lot of the great movies are based on you knowing something that the character doesn't. I, I forget what it's called. I think the term is dramatic irony or something like that. Um, or tragic irony, I confuse the two <clears throat> um, sometimes. So, to, you know, you have this kind of irony where you know something somebody else doesn't. How do you even show that to Inception 4? You can't. All you can do in show Inception 4 are nouns, concrete nouns. You can't show it an abstract noun like justice. You can't show it an abstract noun like misalignment of, of, of beliefs. Like the best systems in the world can't even get started on the richness of the things that we know about in the world. You And can't. let me quote Lisa right. Feldman, that we have great systems that can do facial expressions, but we want to do emotional classification. And going for facial expression, like the emoji of smiling, sad, angry, to the actual emotions is extremely complex and hard task. Because many people, when they're angry, They don't look like the angry smiley or they when they are sad, they don't look like the like the archetype of sad. So it's very hard and we need I, like I, the I, I, cultural context. Sort of strong bad language alert. Um, I, I learned a great term a couple of years ago, which is to grin fuck someone, which is you smile at them while screwing them over. So you're like, yeah, yeah, I appreciate that. I'm going to take care of you. And then you you. <laughs> proceed as right and so like the facial expression in that case is 
inversely correlated with that what's actually intended and it's up to the listener to realize that you know they're being deceived it is very easy or relatively easy to detect a smile i just take these two points in the corner of the mouth and just i check whether they are up or down i can do it but to detect an emotion you need much 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 more you need context you need to understand like why are these people here what's going on is this person going to be truthful are they going to be allowed to express their emotions maybe they're on a stage and you know they had a bad day but they have to pretend to be happy because that's what the the character calls for There's so, a lot of context goes into that so if we think about <clears throat> language interpretation you say it sucks If we think about reasoning and understanding what text means, you say, no, we are not even close. If you yeah, I'm, think, I'm not saying these things are impossible, but I'm no, saying no, no, we're current, we're, we're right now. Tech, and even, and even when we are talking about dogs <laughs> cut classifications, you say, I, it's not cyber attack when I attach a, no, a stick note with the word cat to dog and they say, wow. The network misclassified the dog as cat. So basically the, it's not adversarial new neural network when you change something that is very, very tiny in in the pixel of of an image. It's something completely else. It's something completely different. Yeah, which I mean basically, in a technical yes. sense, you know we call that research on adversaries. But really what we're doing is we're saying, <coughs> what are these systems good for and not good for? Well, they're good at matching pictures. They are not good at understanding relations between entities. So that example of the word iPad on a piece of paper in front of an apple, <coughs> it shows that the whole setup of the system is wrongheaded. If you only have the choices of Apple and iPod, you're lost from the get-go. If you, you have a system that can't <coughs> come up with a richer hypothesis than just one of these two forced choices, it's just not a good system. Like... You just you're in the wrong ballpark if you want to deal with the real world. And now do you encode memory and knowledge, knowledge knowledge representation into your convolutional neural network? You need like a different ar- architecture. So it's, it's like it's like the the normal or the standard convolutional neural networks that you are utilizing in terms of flow or Pytorch, they currently cannot do it. You cannot yeah, I mean, encode there's, there's growing recognition in the field of this one. Um, I've been <clears throat> on this hobby horse for like 30 years. You need some kind of memory system that encodes long-term knowledge <clears throat> in the immediate scene and so forth. A pure convolutional network doesn't do that. It just matches patterns. And people are starting to do things like so-called memory networks and so forth, which I think are a step in the right direction. You need to have persistent stores of information, but you have to take it further than I think people are trying to take it. So you, you have to have a store of the information, let's say, In the scene right now so if i close my eyes i will remember that you are sitting in a chair there's a desk or something like that behind you you've got a microphone in front of you you're indoors i remember all of this stuff right i don't have to see it uh at this moment <coughs> and uh I, you come back and you put, now put yes yeah, so wow it, it, it's but you assume that this is and the same I, person very quickly in milliseconds can come to the conclusion it's unlikely that it Another human being has come into your place. It's more likely that you're using something. It could be you know, a graphical thing or a physical mass, but it takes me like milliseconds to make a guess about <coughs> what plausible physiological or other kinds of mechanisms could explain the change in the scene between when I closed my eyes and then when I reopened them, right? So I'm always reasoning about what's going on. You didn't, I didn't know you were going to do that experiment, right? Yes, um, and you didn't just like like let me say you didn't just came up with the solution. you knew that there was a problem. I, that's right. I identified the anomaly and I solved it in like a hundred milliseconds or something, like a tenth of a second. You know, I had a, a pretty good answer to what was going on. If I watch a movie and like there's an earthquake, I figure out, you know, in milliseconds, I see there's probably an earthquake. That explains wh- why the guy's moving around. And I'm not like running. A module in my head right now of look for masks in front of the guy interviewing me as far as I know that has never happened in my entire career I've done hundreds or thousands I don't even know of interviews before it's never happened I'm not drawing from a database like that it's not Halloween I wasn't tipped off by that you know um, maybe you'll air this on Halloween but it, while we're recording it it's you know the middle of September um, <clears throat> but the human mind wants to explain what causally what is going on how have we got 
from the world that I saw a minute ago to the world that I just saw right now. But What please listen to yourself. The human mind wants, you have this magical world, wants, and we don't have want in those systems. We don't have want, we and you discuss it in the beginning of, of your book. Those systems don't want anything. They don't want anything. So AlphaGo doesn't want to win and go. It just, it does. Um, I don't think the answer is there though. I think the answer is more in the explaining side than the wanting side. So you can get computers to do anything without a lot of desire. They just follow instructions. If we write good instructions, they follow them well. So, you know, if you have a calculator on your computer, you know, it parses the operands and the operators puts them together in a lawful way and it gives you the right answer. It doesn't want to do it. It just does it. Well, we need to have systems that do explanation in the same way. They're just turning the knobs, but they're turning the right set of knobs. And, you know, this famous saying that computer programs are algorithms plus data structures. We just need the right algorithms and data structures and we'll get there. We won't need the want. We don't, the systems don't need to be motivated. There is a second question is like, <clears throat> we talk a lot about having systems maximize certain functions and stuff like that. We may get somewhere by doing that, but it is a big part of what's going on right now. And I think it's dangerous because we don't know how to specify what function we want the systems to optimize and we get into all kinds of trouble around that. The, the cartoon in the book that's an example of that is um, somebody says to their robot, something like, put all the furniture away. Oh, yes. <laughs> the robot is sitting there with a hacksaw cutting, cutting up the couch to put it in, inside the closet. So like, it's more than just maximizing <coughs> abstractly to do the right things. The system has to understand what people want. Okay, so let me, let me please con- confer to you with another thing, because you said in, in your perspective, the solution doesn't lie in the world want. It, it, it's, it doesn't matter if those systems want or they don't have this like wanting capacity. But Melanie Mitchell in her article, Why AI is Harder Than We Think, say that we think that intelligence is separate from the body. Like we have like a, like a brain which is disattached to the body and we can just treat the brain or relate to the brain. But intelligence mm-hmm. in the broader sense is attached to our physical body, to our, uh, and we nowadays computers don't have body. So we might, it's like, I don't want to call it like an NP complete or like an NP problem, but it might be like a sort of NP problems where If you think about like an just mind, just CPU without all the infrastructure of the body, so we, it might be an impossible, theoretically speaking, an impossible problem to solve. I don't think so. I, I, I mean, it's an open question. My feeling is that <coughs> having a body <coughs> excuse me, really helps you a lot. but that it's not necessary. So there are people with spinal muscular atrophy, I believe it is SMA, that can't move their bodies and still understand the world. Um, there are blind people who don't get any visual input. A lot of people are like, the problem with GPT is it doesn't have any visual input. Well, there are blind people who obviously don't have visual input and still have, you know, build very rich representations and understandings of the world and can understand words that relate to perception, even though they don't have visual perception <coughs> and so forth. So I'm not sure how much you need these embodied experiences in order to really understand the world pretty richly. Um, <clears throat> I think it helps. You know, kids, once they start crawling around, learn things faster. So I, I think it's pretty useful, but I don't think it's necessary. But it might be, and you probably say that you disagree with me, so we might be end up with saying, listen, there is some things that we don't need know how to pin but uh, or we don't know to define or we don't know to explain which is transcendental about human being which we basically cannot fully replicate but you said time will tell I don't see anything about human intelligence that is <coughs> transcendental in principle not replicable like you These just seem to me to be programming problems. We don't know how to do the right kind of programming. We don't have the right infrastructure to do it yet, but 
I, I don't, I mean, you could talk about consciousness, but we don't even know what it is for humans. I don't know if you're conscious, you, you know, you giggle and I hope that you are, but I, you know, how do I really know? I don't, I don't have a, a measurement that I can take. Um, but psychology so, speaks about theory of mind reading because you have no access to my inner world, but you assume that you have access and you operate in the world as if you know what my inner world looks like and you get good results. So we have basically like a feeling and you can say mirror neurons, et cetera, but we have a notion of what going through the other person, even telepathy is like feeling from distance. This is a, the meaning of the world. Well, I mean, I think that machines are going to be at a disadvantage because they don't have human experience. And so <clears throat> they're going to have to figure us out in the way that we might figure out how a dog works. So I don't have direct access, but I can figure out a lot of <clears throat> about how a dog works by observation. And machines are going to have to observe us. And hopefully we, you know, we can help them some with the programming. Now, Gary, I just want to conclude and say, first, thank you so much. It was a, so interesting. One of the most interesting con conversations I've ever had. Just one last okay. question or two last questions. If you could just like, in your perspective, what is the most important thing that we need to do to combine people from other disciplines in the AI community, like <coughs> cognitive psychologists and linguistic experts and all those things to just come up together with something that can benefit from the experience of other disciplines? Yeah, I, I think that's right. We need to broaden the tent. People have to stop being such jerks to each other to be you know, blunt about it um, and need to welcome in a lot, a lot of other people with a lot of perspectives. You know, the, the um, Manhattan Project wasn't like solved by one person. It was solved by a lot of people with a common goal who were willing to work with one another. <clears throat> we're not going to solve AI without that. And after reading your fascinated book, Rebooting AI, Building Artificial Intelligence We Can Trust, what will be like the next book in the subject of AI that you recommend? Now, this is like number one, but what is number two that you recommend? I think it depends on how technical you want to be, but I guess I would go with Udaya Pearl's book, The Book of Why, on, on causality, because I think that's something that's neglected and important. Okay, The Book of Why. Gary, Marcus, thank you so much for everything you have done and doing to the world of AI, to the AI community, and the waking call that you say, and you always speak about, even like 10 years ago and even before, your books are fantastic. Your ideas are mind-blowing. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot for having me. It was a fun conversation. Okay. Bye-bye. Guy, this was Gary Marcos. He is a fantastic researcher and a scholar and his book just blew my mind and i think that this is a very important voice in the world of ai we we need people that say you know going go to the other direction or look the other way and if all the people are looking the same way you need to pause and reflect and i think that gary marcus is doing exactly this and uh, we will have Melanie Mitchell on the show, which is also a great scientist and also speak about why AI is harder than we think. If you loved this talk, please put thumb up and consider subscribing and hit the bell button. I was Roy Yozovich. Thank you so much. <laughs>